now that you have learned about particle feeding, you may be thinking, ah, that is not the way I want to obtain my uh, nourishment, the, the essential nutrients, the macronutrients. Uh, because when you think about particle feeding, what are all those little particles animals are collecting? Well, yes, indeed. In many cases, it's going to be the broken bodies resulting from the composition of things that died uh, in the water, in the ocean. But keep in mind what we've learned in this class, that animals are going to optimize, meaning try to get the most energy uh, from the things that they eat in exchange for the smallest effort, finding, searching for, capturing, and then consuming the food. So when you think about those animals that are, you know, particle feeders, like filter feeders or deposit feeders, yes, the diet they have is not glamorous by any means, but it requires so little effort to get the nutrition they need. And so when you think about feeding, you most likely like the idea of bulk feeding. Yes, let's feed on a large steak or something that will give you a sense of satisfaction after the meal. Bulk feeding, however, yes, it does have benefits, like uh, getting a lot of energy in one uh, act of consuming the food. Uh, there's also going to be uh, benefits uh, like uh, maybe a variety of different things you can select to feed uh, in, in large amounts, in large quantities. But the disadvantages are going to include that there's going to be a greater amount of effort finding larger items to consume. Think about predators and what they have to do in order to catch prey. There's also going to be a greater investment when it comes to the development of the body of the animal. There's going to be a greater amount of time needed developing a complete uh, digestive system with all of the accessory glands like pancreas, like liver, and many others that are going to be assisting with the process of chemical digestion. And then you also have to invest energy producing the uh, structures like uh, uh, teeth for chewing, like claws for securing, hanging onto the prey. And so both feeding, yes, by all means, I'm all for it. It, it's, it's a good thing to have, but don't lose track of the point that it also requires investments in the development, investments in the capturing of food, and those are worries that animals that are doing suspension feeding do not have to engage in. So let's talk for a moment about uh, uh, what bulk feeding means, uh, large items, and think about the need for specialized body parts, limbs, uh, sophisticated mouth parts, sensory organs, and all of that. Obtaining large amounts of food sometimes is going to depend on an animal's ability to modify the food supply. You have seen, for example, the case of leaf cutter ants. Well, in reality, what the ants are consuming is not the leaf itself. But these ants are going to be carrying their leaf cutouts carrying them down underground into chambers where another group of ants is going to be chewing up a little bit the leaves and spreading spores of a fungus that will soon begin to grow on the leaves. When the mycelium, that is, the body of the fungus, grows on the leaves, it can be harvested and then the ants can proceed to feed on the fungus, not on the leaf. So here the modification of food supply is a clever one because ants are bypassing eating the leaf, which is largely cellulose, a carbohydrate, but then by allowing a fungus to first feed on that cellulose, on those carbohydrates, and the fungus in turn making a body called the mycelium, the body of the fungus, the mycelium, is going to have larger amounts of protein, and so that is going to be beneficial for the ants. But then, as we go through all of these examples, don't lose track of the investments in energy, going and cutting the leaves, taking them underground, making this fungus garden before food can be enjoyed. Aphid herding ants are another example that I have for modifying food supply. These aphid herding ants usually collect aphids, which are these little 
uh, insects you see in this illustration. And so here they are, like green looking things. The aphids themselves are feeding on the sap produced by plant organs like leaves and even young stems. So they usually, uh, aphids are going to appear in places where there is a large flow of sap loaded with sugary uh, materials. What the ants do is that they don't feed on the aphids. They collect the aphids, round them up, and make their own little herd, like a cowboy rounding up a herd of cattle, all the cows, to later go and milk them. Well, milk is not what these aphids will produce, but when the bodies are so swollen with all the plant sap they have been taken, they will have to relieve some of that pressure by allowing some of that sugary fluid they have been feeding on out through an excretory pore they have in the posterior end of the animal. It comes out as a little droplet that is called honeydew. It, it's sweet to the ant. And so then the ant, what it has to do then is open its jaws and bring that you know, little uh, droplet of honeydew close to the mouth where they can just swallow it as a whole. So what the ants want, see the, the, the clever idea here is the ants want the sap the plant is producing, but the ants cannot collect it because they don't have a mouth for feeding, tapping into the sugary solutions of a plant. Aphids have that type of mouth. Aphids have a sharp little mouth like a, like a very fine hypodermic needle, and with that they can take in uh, the sap from the plant, and then they in turn end up feeding uh, the ants. So how is this benefiting the aphids at all? Well, the aphids also benefit because ants protect them from enemies aphids have. Enemies like ladybugs and other insects who would like to feed on the aphids. Well, while the ants are around, getting the benefit of the honeydew secreted by the aphids, the ants will be protecting the aphids from their enemies. So it's a win-win situation. We call in biology symbiosis, a specific case called mutualism. Symbiotic mutualism means that one organism benefits and the other one gets an equal benefit from the relationship. Sometimes to feed on larger items, animals have to set up traps. And perhaps the one trap that comes to mind of many of you will be the trap in the form of a spider web. So spiders get large items to feed on by setting up the web and then trapping insects or other organisms that get caught in the web. Well, spiders are not the only ones who can set up traps. Remember that these are limpets, which is a type of a mollusk. Uh, they're going to be particle feeders. They are deposit feeders, but the deposit feeding here is in combination with a trap. What the limpets do is they slowly crawl over a rock, laying out a trail of mucus. The trail of mucus is like a double-sided, double-stick scotch tape. So it sticks to the rock, but the upper side of the mucus is also sticky. So all of the particles, the sediments of the broken bodies, of things that died in the water settle on top of that mucus. And what the snail does then is like follow its slithering pathway back. As the snail, the limpet, is going back, it's using its mouth to eat the mucus laid out earlier and all of the food particles that became entrapped in that mucus. Ant lions, which you see here in this illustration, is going to be the larval stage of an insect known as a lanternfly. Uh, sometimes it kind of looks like a, uh, like a very large grasshopper with a, with a strange looking type of a head. Look for a lantern, like a flashlight, lanternfly on the web and you'll find images of what these insects look like. Well, in the larval stages, these animals can spend about two or three years of their lives and they bury themselves in soft sand. When they go under the soft sand, they're going to make like a funnel trap. Insects like ants that happen to make the mistake of walking into this funnel will slide in here 
it will be real difficult for them to crawl out because the sand is so loose. Every time they try to crawl out, they will just end up back at the bottom of the funnel where this ant lion is going to be waiting with ferocious jaws, its mandibles that are modified to work like hypodermic needles again. And with those mandibles, like hollow tubes, these uh, ant lions are going to end up sucking the juices out of the uh, ant. Well, in reality, they're going to be sucking the hemolymph out of the ant, now that you know about these kinds of uh, internal circulatory fluids uh, of animals. Deception sometimes can be helpful at catching larger prey. Here you see a spider that is going to, instead of making a spider web, they release a thread of silk. At the end of the silk, they put another bunch of silk and they get this silk like completely covered with a secretion from the spider itself that imitates the scent of moths. Then they dangle this little globule of silk and hormones to attract uh, moths. And when the moths come by, they get stuck by this long, sticky piece of silk with, uh, with the wet pheromone copycat. And then the ants proceed to eat the moth. So it's deception because the moth is thinking, oh, I found a mate. I'm going to produce some offspring. But in reality, they end up becoming the meal of the spider. This fish you see here, this is going to be the dorsal fin. Here's the mouth of the fish. Here's the eye. But the first uh, uh, ray in the dorsal fin is actually separated and it's extended out looking like a lure. This here looks like a small fish. But the fish, who is the owner of this lure, doesn't look like a fish. It looks like a rock on the bottom of the ocean. Another fish may be attracted to the lure, thinking, oh, that's a small fish. I can eat that. Being completely unaware of this angler fish, they come, they begin to check out this, and before they can open their mouths to take in the lure, the angler fish opens his mouth as wide as he can make it and swallows the unsuspecting fish. And so that is going to be another example of deception, using a lure to attract the prey. Sometimes animals are going to rely on tools. And uh, it is interesting now that scientists are really getting out there into every possible environment, that they're discovering that uh, primates are not the only ones, the only animals capable of using tools. Here in this illustration, you see the case of a chimp who has obtained a branch from a tree, stripped all the leaves, and then they use that stick to put it into the uh, termite mound. When the stick goes into the termite mound, termites sense that as a threat. Soldier termites go and begin clinging onto the stick and uh, because they think it's the enemy. So when the chimp pulls out the stick, it's going to be covered with all of these termites that are now clinging to the stick. And all they have, the chimp has to do is enjoy termites on a stick. It's one of their favorite kinds of food. Here, you see another example of a tool. Not a stick, but a rock. Egyptian vultures live in Africa in places where ostriches also live. Sometimes an ostrich may walk away from a nest, leaving the egg exposed. The beak of these birds is not powerful enough to crack open the thick, uh, hard covering of the egg. But these Egyptian vultures have it built into their genes to find a rock, pick it up with the mouth, then walk up to the egg and throw the rock at the egg, and the rock will break the egg, and then they can proceed to consume the contents of the egg. The tool used in this case is going to be the rock. So the idea of a tool is going to be using an object that can help an animal obtain food that otherwise the animal will never be able to obtain. Some animals that engage in bulk feeding are going to be engaging in group feeding. And there are many advantages uh, animals hunting in groups are going to enjoy, like there's going to be less area to search as a group. There's going to be a uh, faster time and, and shorter amount of area covered by each individual. 
if you divide the searching area by all the members of the searching party. There's also going to be a lower risk of predation. Look, all animals, even predators, could get attacked or be eaten by something else. But if predators are part of a group, that they have a lower chance of finding another enemy that may kill them. And it also increases food capture efficiency. Uh, this ricochet effect means that imagine a group of wild dogs or, or hyenas chasing prey. If the prey turns in one direction like a bullet ricocheting off the target, there's going to be another group of the hunters that are coming in the direction where prey is trying to make its escape. Pack hunters that you may be aware of include the lions, the hyenas, the wild dogs. They are listed here not only in the rank based on size, like lions are the biggest ones, hyenas will be smaller than lions, but they are bigger than the wild dogs. But also look at the hunting effectiveness. 50% effectiveness here means that lions end up making a kill about 50% of the time they hunt. So half the time they don't get anything. And so if, if they're still eating, what are they eating? Well, lions often, instead of hunting what they eat, they go and take it away from another hunter. Hyenas have a reputation for being scavengers, but actually hyenas are more effective hunters than lions because they actually manage to kill about 70% of the stuff they chase. And the most effective of all hunters are going to be these African wild dogs, the smallest of the social hunters in Africa. They have an effectiveness of up to 90%. And it all has to do with the strategies. Lions are not fast, so they have to stalk the prey. Prey uh, will never know usually where the lions are because the lions keep themselves concealed with the line of the grass. And then they have to like rush uh, and surprise the prey if they hope to get anything. Hyenas use something different. They kind of chase, you know, the prey. They make themselves known that they are in the place uh, where prey are found. And they, what they do is they like only half chase animals in, in an effort to try to spot the ones that are weaker or sick. And those are the ones that they chase. Coursing means chasing the prey, not at high speed, but chase, 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 chase steadily until the prey becomes exhausted they are fatigued and then the hyenas make the kill. Hyenas are known for their stamina. They can run and run and they will outrun most of the things they hunt. Uh, but in terms of running and getting prey exhausted, the champions are going to be the African wild dogs. They can really just stay on the trail of prey, uh, even things like gazelles. And even though the gazelle is much faster than a wild dog, the gazelle will eventually get exhausted, tired, and then the wild dogs make the kill. The reason I like this comparison is because sometimes people have these misconceptions like lions, oh, you know, the king of the jungle. Well, first of all, they don't live in a jungle. Uh, lions live in a prairie in the savanna, and they are not the most effective of killers. I'm sorry for you cat lovers. Uh, lions are amazing. They are formidable uh, hunters, but in terms of the best, most effective hunters, it is the African wild dogs that are going to take the prize. And that will make happy any of you dog lovers. Dolphins are going to also hunt in groups. They usually round up groups of fish uh, so they can eat them. Sometimes they'll push them close to the shore and then the dolphins will just like ram, uh, swim in synchrony like many dolphins next to one another. To, to make a wave that will push the fish out of the water. And what you see here is this dolphin trying to cut, catch the fish that have been washed up ashore while they're still flapping on the mud at the edge of, uh, of the water. Gray whales also will work in groups. They will produce bubble nets under a school of fish. The bubbles continue to move in the water up towards the surface. They form like a net. The fish don't know what to do. And so many times fish will be swimming upwards to try to get away from the bubbles when they are near the surface. That's when the whales come off to, up to the surface, open their mouth, and take their mouthfuls of fish. And there is another surprising animal because most people don't expect birds to be group hunters. But there's one species that is known to grow up as uh, hunt as groups, 
and that is going to be the Harris Hawks. Harris Hawks live in the deserts of uh, southwestern United States, the Sonora Desert to be precise. And uh, every morning, a group of uh, three or four or five, you know, sometimes even eight of these hawks will get together and look for prey on the ground, like a jackrabbit or a cottontail. And uh, those kinds of um, animals are going to provide enough food for a group of two or three hunters. The way they set up the hunt is that while some are staying up perched on a tree uh, or a cactus, they can do that also. There's going to be another one flying, trying to make the kill, eventually landing on the ground, trying to catch the jackrabbit. If the one on the ground loses track of the prey, then one of the perched animals will go down on the ground and continue with the pursuit until they catch something. So here is hawks are relevant in this subject of group feeding because it's the one type of bird known to hunt in groups like the way a pack of wolves would do, like a pride of lions, uh, like a pack of hyenas. And so that is going to be uh, all that I wanted to tell you about uh, group feeding. These are some uh, interesting stories we have from the animal kingdom, and I wanted you to be aware of those as well. That's all for right now.